it's uh, important uh, every so often to take a good look at the curriculum, see what you're doing, uh, and to decide what to do for the future. And uh, the last time the department really did this on a comprehensive basis was in 1970. So we decided that uh, in 1986 and 87, it was time again to take another look at the curriculum. And if I could have the first slide. Uh, this is, these are the members of the committee who conducted the study, a committee of about nine faculty members um, who had the following goals. If I could have the uh, next slide. The goal of the study, which uh, took place over the year 1986-87, was first to conduct a comprehensive review of our present curriculum and the future needs. And then, more important, to lead the faculty in a process of evaluation and change. From the beginning, we thought it was not enough simply to analyze the uh, curriculum and issue a report, but to actually develop an action plan or an implementation plan that would then lead us to some of the changes you're going to hear from uh, Professor Sawn and Merrill. Uh, the committee worked uh, all year. Uh, and then at the end of the year, we had a uh, session at Endicott House in which we had the whole faculty present to uh, review the results and mutually agree on the uh, direction to proceed. Could I have the next slide? Well, as Clark mentioned, uh, the process that we established in looking at what we were doing was threefold. First, uh, to review the results of, of the numerous studies that were underway then on the future of chemical engineering. And uh, Professor Way has uh, given some examples of the, the Amundsen report, which uh, was a very important study. There were a number of other studies underway at that time. The University of Texas had an important study. We essentially collected all of the articles that talked about the crises, the future opportunities, and assimilated the information. Then the second thing we did was to survey the alumni from the classes of 70, 75, 80, and 85. And I'm sure there are people here in the room who responded to that questionnaire. And finally, we then analyzed the curriculum. If I could have the next slide. Well, the alumni survey uh, asked a number of questions. But uh, first, we asked them uh, how their careers had progressed since they left MIT. Our goal here in the, in the marketing context was to, um, to survey the customers of our product and find out how they were using it. And uh, b uh, basically, we gave the, the respondents gave what would amount to a resume, showing us how they had uh, progressed since they left MIT. Uh, we asked them what were the five most significant accomplishments. We asked them what was most valuable about their MIT and what was most lacking from their MIT education. I'll talk first about this question of how their careers uh, progress. As you can imagine, the data was very uh, diverse, uh, trying to put some order into uh, all the various events that had happened to people. And so uh, the approach that, that we used, as shown on the next slide, like any chemical engineer, was to con con construct a, a flow sheet. And, uh, <laughs> This is an example of the results of the survey from uh, the class of 1980. It's not totally typical, because 1980 was an unusual year. There were plentiful jobs for chemical engineers. Enrollments were at an all-time high. But I'm going to use this as an example to show you some of the differences between the results from the other class. The first thing we noticed that is out of 100% uh, percent of the bachelor's graduates, in that particular year, an unusually large percent went right to work in industry. Uh, the others, a smaller group, went into graduate school at that time, and then medicine and law also picked up a significant uh, portion of the graduates. But then a rather interesting thing happened after these people went into employment. You'll notice they then pursued their graduate education uh, so that uh, as of today, or as of 1986, uh, the number who were still working without any further education was only at that time 29%. And this is going to continue to change, I pr uh, predict, as more and more of these uh, continue their education. 
The differences between the earlier classes of 75 and 70 were that in those years, the number that went directly to work after graduating was only about 25 percent. And by the time of the survey, in every case, in both of those classes, there were in fact no uh, respondents who had not gotten some graduate degree beyond their MIT education. So the bottom line is uh, the four-year degree is not the end point for any of our graduates. And uh, if they don't, if, even those that go directly to work will generally continue their education at some later point. So we're really preparing students to learn. I wish time permitted me to share some of the detailed uh, significant accomplishments that the um, respondents uh, presented. It's really impressive to see the breadth of, of responsibility and achievements that were, that were made. Um, we found out that about, uh, of the class of 1970, about two to one ratio in terms of management versus technical careers at that time. For the others, it was split at about 50-50 at that point. I should say the class of 1985 was too, they, their, their careers had not progressed at all, and so we saw only the initial result. And at that time, by the way, the percentage had returned back to 25 percent who went directly to work. Okay, if I could skip on to the, the next slide uh, and then continue on. Uh, we asked them what were the most valuable aspects of their MIT education, and to a person, they uh, but for all the classes, it was uh, remarkably consistent that we saw these things listed as the most important. First, this ability to learn to think quickly and logically. That uh, was so overwhelming uh, that, that it was really, really remarkable. The breadth of courses that they took, uh, so their breadth of training was, was extremely important. The fact that they learned discipline, hard work, how to learn, and then finally, the MIT reputation and contacts and the people they met when they were here. There was no difference between the class of 70, the class of 85. This was consistent across the board throughout their career. If we look at the things they found most lacking, though, there was a very significant difference between the more recent classes and the earlier ones. If I could see the next slide. The things from the classes of 80 and 85 that they felt were most missing were practical real world problems. They mentioned unit operations. They mentioned use of computers. They mentioned career guidance. Uh, these were all things that uh, engineers right out on graduates newly on the job uh, would face in terms of their needs. If we looked at the earlier classes, though, 70 and 75, on the next slide, they didn't, they didn't miss any of those earlier things. They didn't miss the unit operations or the computers. Uh, what they were missing were communication skills, business training, and liberal arts. Now, I don't think our curriculum changed during the time between 70 and 75 and 80 and 85 to account for this. Instead, what uh, it presents is the evolving careers of the graduates and the needs they find. In the later stages of their careers, these are the things that they find most important. When they're just getting started, the things mentioned on the previous slide were the ones uh, that were most important. If I could have the next slide. Well, in addition to doing the alumni survey uh, and surveying the studies underway, we also uh, took a very detailed analysis of our curriculum. We broke uh, all of the subjects, the required subjects, in not only chemical engineering, but also chemistry, physics, mathematics, we broke them up into basic elementary modules. And we, conduct, con, uh, we constructed a giant map, if you will, uh, of the whole curriculum, showing all the concepts that were taught in the courses, how they interrelated with each other, uh, and where they led to. And uh, <clears throat> the conclusion of this, uh, well, there, there, was, there was one thing that was very obvious that's not listed on the slide, was the large number of things that students learned as an undergraduate maybe in physics courses, mathematics courses, it never seemed to be used anywhere else. And at first we thought, well, maybe that indicates something is redundant that could be left out. But as we began to think of it, uh, if nothing was redundant and left out, that forms the structure or the skeleton on which as they, as they later are going to build. And so even though uh, everything is not covered in the, their education, it can very well be used later. 
but we concluded that the basic curriculum was sound. The fundamentals were there. It needed some minor tuning. It needed a change in uh, a few courses, but basically the concept was fine. We were very concerned about whether uh, we should have a computer requirement. As we looked, though, we found that about 85% of the students elect a computer course anyway. And uh, so instead, what we needed was a computer proficiency requirement that would still give the students a chance to learn computing in uh, whatever way they might choose uh, from the courses at the Institute. And since the number of required subjects is very limited, it certainly didn't make sense to uh, make a requirement of something that everyone did anyway. And then finally, uh, there was the conclusion that we needed to integrate education in the context of the more diverse real world problems. One of the obvious uh, results of all these earlier studies was that chemical engineers are moving into a much broader range of uh, applications. We need to find some way to be able to integrate those applications uh, into their education. And uh, there was a big move underfoot. Uh, also, I should mention this is institute wide to uh, improve the educational process by putting more uh, technology in the context of the total problem. And this then led to the concept of uh, integrated chemical engineering. And I think I should say that uh, this uh, concept actually was first originated by Professor Herb Sohn. And uh, following the, the re publication of this report, Herb has then taken the lead in uh, the implementation plan, and he'll talk about that next. Thank you. Could I have the first slide, please? Um, what I'm going to be t talking about is basically something that I mentioned in a committee meeting to be provocative, and what you're going to see is the results of the um, of the committee after that, which is certainly quite different than what was suggested, but I think achieves the goals that we're trying to accomplish. What we're talking about is integrated chemical engineering, and that's a concept uh, that uh, uh, Jim Way purported. Uh, the real goal of what we're trying to do is to better teach the fundamentals of chemical engineering, not to radically um, uh, change the concepts or what needs to be taught, but to do a better job. The needs we are trying to address is to reduce course-dependent learning, learning where a student learns a concept of transport in one course, but does not readily carry that over to uh, work in, um, say, a reactor design course or another course. We saw that there was a, a course dependency. The students did not carry material which they understood in one course to another course also to give students some experiment, experience in working with synthetic problems rather than analysis. That is dealing with large complex problems which have ambiguities, dealing with the entire picture and from that having to come up with a solution, something which is not commonly involved in problems in our normal courses. Also we wanted to present our fundamental materials in the context of how they might be used in industry. In addition, uh, we want to uh, develop problem-solving skills, particularly the definition of the problem, how you take this large, complex problem with both its technological and social um, consequences and define what really the problem is that you ought to be working on also to identify the background which you need, the skills which you need to solve such a problem, whether you need to hire consultants or whether you need to learn more material, and the notion of continuing education that basically um, what we get at MIT is education. Uh, that is not going to stop. We have to do both self-education and additional classwork education after the student gets out of MIT. And we want to enhance their professional awareness. That is, uh, let them see some industrial problems, uh, give them some experience, some ideas about new fields and opportunities, and the social context in which those problems will be cast. Next slide, please. Uh, the concept of the ICE, the Integrated Chemical Engineering, is basically based 
upon industrial problem solving. The concept is uh, this is the way that chemical engineers and in industry would solve a problem. You have a library of books, the books which you've learned from sitting on a shelf, uh, and so that we have a library that the text or the course does not follow along a text, but we have a group of texts which the students have purchased. From that, we're going to use those to solve the set of problems. We're going to solve a, a series of cases which are about one month in duration. Uh, so the students will see five or six cases in which they solve. These are posed to the students at the beginning of each module as a fairly ill-defined, complex problem. The first week or so of class, several weeks of class, is really in identifying a strategy for solution. What is the problem? What can we do? What are all the different angles about the consequences of the solution? Based on that, you identify what you want to do. You identify the background information that you must acquire. And that background information, using this library of books, is taught much in the same way that we now teach our courses. We take chapters from those books, acquire the necessary background. The homework and quizzes are given in normal fashion. The problems are largely centered around the solution of this case. Case topics are picked to emphasize some of the current problems, such as waste treatment, biotechnology, microelectronics, pollution, uh, product uh, development, things which uh, we have trouble incorporating within our standard text and the standard examples given within the text. Let me note that this is different than a case study type of approach in that we're not just analyzing somebody else's solution. The class is really going through the solution process themselves. So it's not a case study. It's not a case analysis. It's really doing a project as a class. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the implementation of the ICE is basically we've developed two senior courses. They replaced the existing chemical design course and subsume that. We are presently going through a, a trial class. Uh, it was mentioned that uh, Chemi was started with 11 students. Well, we have eight to 100 years later embarking on this endeavor. Um, next year, it will be an optional subject offering after we get the bugs out of it this year. And in 1990-91, it's going to be required for the Chemi curriculum. Next slide. Uh, this is a list of the example of the projects that are going to be taught in the, um, the uh, preliminary, the test case this year. Production of acetic anhydride from acetone and acetic acid. This is going to be taught by Professor George Stephanopoulos. Uh, it will encompass many of the standard design type concepts, the concept and the practice of design with an example of the classical chemical process industry. The second is the production of trial size uh, batches of monomer for a market trial of a particular polymeric material. This brings in not only the process design involved in a batch process, but also the engineering economics. The third is a drug delivery system for brain cancer. This will be taught by Bob uh, Langer, uh, centered around uh, some of his current research, and will teach advanced transport, uh, kinetics, product design concepts. The fourth one, uh, I'll leave that for Ed Merrill to discuss. Uh, he's going to be following on and go through what is typically happening in this. This is a product development where we're developing a product that he calls polybeads for uh, novel separation processes. The fifth uh, uh, case project is the cleanup of a toxic waste dump. This is uh, going to be taught jointly by John Ehrenfeld and Adel Seraphim. It deals with the modeling and the understanding of a waste dump, how it's similar to that of a packed bed, brings in the concepts of that. It also deals with how you uh, extract the chemicals from such a waste, uh, waste dump and then process them to take care of the um, toxic materials. 
and all the societal and political implications involved with this sort of cleanup endeavor. Next slide. Uh, the fundamentals that, uh, to repeat, the fundamentals that are being taught are the fundamentals of process design, advanced transport and reactor design, the synthetic problem solving, that is the dealing of large, with large complex uh, problems that have boundary conditions associated not only with technological but with societal impl implementations. Uh, also product development, something that we don't see in most chemical engineering standard curriculums. Engineering economics, process control. Next slide. Some of the um, attributes of this approach are really that we're mo we can modify our curriculum by the content, by the, um, the projects which we choose for these modules. So it all allows us for the curriculum to easily evolve as, as the needs evolve so that we don't have a stagnant curriculum. There is a potential of writing modular tests. There's a great barrier to writing uh, uh, text materials because it involves a lot of time. But the concept of writing a smaller text that accounts for one of these case projects is not such an onerous task, and we're hoping that will propagate. It involves all the faculty, or most of the faculty, talking about their current research. And I think this is one of the things that made chemical engineering very exciting in 1920, is the people teaching the classes were talking about their research and the evolving concepts. And that's what we hope to inject into these courses. Faculty are much better when they're talking about their research. It <laughs> It requires, I, I've got to be careful, I'm the junior person of here. Uh, <laughs> the only non-full professor giving a talk this morning, so I've got to be careful. Uh, it also requires a greater teaching at effort. We're talking about two semesters in which we have eight faculty uh, very much involved. So it's a greater teaching effort, and we're trying to have greater contact between the student and feel that any time when we have good contact between the students and the faculty, very good things happen. Thank you very much. The next talk will be given by Ed Merrill talking about his module to give you an example of what's going to go into these courses. Before I present uh, the module that Herb Son asked me to consider doing in this program, I'd like to make a few comments. First, uh, this is a wild experience for me because it's like the television program, This Is Your Life. I have uh, met students from the last 38 years of my service on the MIT faculty, uh, and it's, uh, it's amazing to think how many of them uh, remember me, not for what I taught them, but for the bizarre things like the Alice in Wonderland stories and so on. I don't know as I taught them anything that was really engineering, but they did remember some jokes. <laughs> uh, as, far as, as far as age is concerned, Herb Son points out his youthfulness. And I am reminded of the fact that, and, and by Jimmy Way of birthdays, that my birthday happens to coincide with the birthday of that great text by Walker, Lewis, and McAdams called Principles of Chemical Engineering. We both came out in the same year. And, f and furthermore, I'm reminded of the fact through uh, Hoyt's and Fritz's uh, allocution to you that I am a, curiously a connector in this conference because in point of fact, I, I am a chemical engineer and came to serve on the MIT faculty and be a student at MIT in the graduate school precisely because of William Henry McAdams who gave a course in chemical engineering in the chemistry department at Harvard where I was a student. And it is uh, to Doc Lewis that I had my first plunge in being a research assistant for a professor who had very strong ideas as to how the research was going to be carried out. And boy, did he tell me how to do it. Merrily said, damn it, shut up a minute, let me talk. And, and so we would have this graceful dialogue and we would finally... <laughs> 
It was uh, with Fritz Meissner that uh, I was first a student in his uh, chemical engineering thermodynamics 1040, where I unwittingly served as a foil, as a kind of a, a fool's cap. I would say the stupidest things in the class would laugh and Fritz would play along with it. I don't know why I did that. But anyhow, it led us to a very happy relationship because I then became his teaching assistant in the course which was called Industrial Chemistry of Colloidal and Amorphous Materials, which was written by Walker Lewis, uh, Walker, uh, uh, I'm sorry, Lewis, Broughton, and Squires. Doc Lewis, uh, Broughton, and Squires. Jeff Broughton and, and Lom Squires. And that was effectively, of course, partly in po colloids, partly in polymers, despite its name. And that led me to carry out my doctoral research under the direction of Fritz Meissner uh, and taught me principles I've never forgotten. And I also sh should acknowledge, of course, the tremendous help of Ed Gilliland and as Doc Lewis, as my mentors when I was first on the faculty in 1950, uh, coming back as a young, timid, oh, terrified, a uh, young fellow trying to teach a class and absolutely terrified by the whole thing. And uh, both Gilliland and Lewis gave me tremendous guidance and continue to do throughout their, our association. Now to get to the purpose of what I'm here to talk to you about, let me have the first slide, please. Integrated chemical engineering. Uh, and the next slide, or maybe I can do it, next slide. I run it backwards and say first, it should be engineering uh, based on science, using science of course, but fundamentally engineering, not science. Secondly, it should have something to do with chemistry in it. And thirdly, it should be integrated. And it should be integrated not only in respect to the technological parts, but also in the larger context of economics, industry, and societal responsibility. The slides keep melting this morning. I don't know what that phenomenon is. There's something very interesting going on. You see there's a, <laughs> a cloud develops at a certain time. We better go on to the next slide before evaporate. There we are. I'm going to pre present an overview of concepts involved in what uh, Herb Sohn suggested I uh, take on, namely a module that involves process development and product development in combination. Uh, and the details of this will be developed, of course, in the interaction uh, with the class of students. It's, it's not set in concrete at this point in time, but as you see, there are a number of issues that we can take on and discuss as a class and work on. And to a significant degree, I've conceived this module as a result not only of my experience uh, in industry before I came back to MIT, but also industrial associations since that time, and in particular, with my current graduate students who are involved in my laboratory, some of them working on problems very closely related to this, and I hope that when they see what I'm about to say, they won't break out in hysterical laughter. Now to go on with the next slide. We present the polybead corporation to you, and we're the new product development uh, department thereof. And you as uh, the students in this class have as your initial charge to develop bead-like particles, as yet undefined, which can become suspended in a liquid mixture, bind to their surfaces only a targeted species, but no other species. In other words, they are specific and not general in their capacity to binding, and finally be removed by a simple and fast separation process. Embodied therein in those three uh, requirements are a whole spectrum of technological issues. Next slide, please. And as a first scheme, we have to focus in on what, re what really is the purpose of developing these bead-like particles before we can address this second immediate zone, which are the immediate technical issues. And having done that, we go out into the broader technical issues and then finally into issues that are supra-technical. They go beyond it. They involve it, but they go beyond it. And so to take, next slide please, the issue of mission focus. 
this, this central issue, the key issue to start with, at least in this development. What do we want to do? Next slide, please. Are the beads to be developed as a diagnostic test? For example, are they to be uh, aimed at detecting human immune virus? Are they supposed to harvest what they are going after, capture it, but allow it to be recovered subsequently? As for example, protein A on a surface will harvest monoclonal antibody and you want the monoclonal antibody back. But you don't want, for example, in target destruction, you don't want the human immune virus back. You want to know that it's there and then you want to kill it. Uh, is it to be used as, as a form of simple purification of a liquid mixture? And having addressed the issues of the product objective, what we want the beads for, next slide, please, which I've already given you some indication of this. It indicates that we ought to think about the, the target of this in terms of its size and its molecular properties. Is it an antibody of molecular weight order, order of 100,000 uh, dollars? Is it a chromium ion? Is it a viral particle that can be seen <clears throat> under a transmission electron microscope or even a scanning electron microscope? Is it a blood platelet, which is one micron across? The scale of the size of this will certainly make a tremendous difference in what we decide the bead should be to capture this particular target. Next slide, please. That then brings up the next ring, the immediate technical issues involved in proceeding with the development of the bead-like product. Next slide, please. First thing, of course, is what are the properties of the liquid environment? Acidic, or basic. If the bead obviously is, is something that will dissolve in acid and the medium is acid, you haven't got any, any bead to, to worry about, it's gone. If the uh, solution is very high density and the bead is, is uh, a very low density, obviously it's going to be impossible to keep the bead in the solution. Uh, so that the, na the, the very question of suspending beads in involves the concept of having something near neutrally buoyant and therefore some fluid mechanics comes into it, as well as in the question of viscous. If the fluid is extremely viscous, we'd have to think about how the beads, uh, what, what size they should be, uh, in order to separate them subsequently. And so this will inf involve a discussion, you see, cutting across many uh, physical and chemical uh, parameters to make the decision as to subsequently how we're going to separate. But before we come to that, next slide, please. Here's where some processing gets into the picture. What should the bead-like particles be formed from? My, one of my uh, uh, areas of interest is polymer synthesis. And so it would be natural for me to think about cross-linking styrene with divinyl benzene or making nylon by interfacial polymerization. But with, in consort with my colleagues, uh, in ceramics, we might also think about making beads of silica or alumina or magnetite, especially uh, if we want the magnetic part of it as a means of separation subsequently. Or we might make the beads composite by having one species, say magnetite, embedded in a polystyrene capsule. And should they be, for example, solid, completely solid, or should they be microporous? And if so, what should they be the pore size? Uh, there's no point in having it microporous if we're trying to harvest blood platelets because they're already one micron across. Uh, what should be the, what size range do we require? Should they be fixed in size or do we have a permissible size range or distribution? But clearly we'd be in trouble if we have a distribution ranging over three orders of magnitude. Say the, the, the beads range from 0.1 micron up to 1,000 microns because then separation would be almost impossible. We address these issues in terms of uh, the uh, way we're going to make them, but let me show you that as an example of beads. The next slide, please. Uh, beads made uh, for the purpose of chromatographic separations on a very large scale. They're microporous, they're made for size exclusion chromatography, and they have a remarkably close distribution of sizes. As you can see from the bar uh, sizing, these beads are approximately 10 to 15 microns in diameter. 
And this is the kind of bead-like product that we're thinking about, but the question is, what is the size and should it be porous? Uh, next slide, please. So we then think of how we're going to form the beads and consider chemical roots, for example, pearl polymerization, or should it be emulsion polymerization? Or should it be the nylon rope trick, which is interfacial polymerization between two different liquid phases? Or should it be produced from an oscillating jet that produces beads into a stream that convex them away and then they set up? There, of course, is a set of processing questions that we will address. And then the next slide, please. How do we, and we probably thought about this, this is a poor place for this, we must have thought about this concept much earlier on. How will we get the beads away from the liquid? Centrifuge them? Well, we can if they have a density difference, but obviously if they're exactly neutrally buoyant, that won't work. Should they be microfiltered through a microfiltration uh, screen? Uh, by a magnetic field, or can we use an electric field to separate them? And the next slide, please. Here is another example of chemical processing. How should we make this active surface on the bead? Shall we activate, for example, polystyrene beads with sulfur trioxide to form the ion exchange beads styrene sulfonate? Shall we use radiation grafting to put on some kind of a monomer on top of the supporting sphere? Shall we covalently bind a ligand such as protein A to the bead surface in order to scavenge out monoclonal antibody, leaving every other protein in the soup behind? Next slide, please. And now we turn to the broader technical issues in the next outer ring. And the next slide, please. What are the hazards in the manufacture of these beads and in the utilization by the customer? In the manufacturing process, for example, with styrene and divinyl benzene, could you have a fire? Could you have an explosion? Are the uh, workers in the plant subjected to fumes that are long-term or short-term toxic. If, for example, vinyl chloride were involved in this manufacture, or if benzene were, it would be an extremely hazardous thing to do. In utilization by the customer, suppose clinical technicians using beads that have been intended to harvest human immune virus are exposed to the beads with the virus on it. There is a tremendous issue of health hazard involved. Next slide, please. And that, of course, brings up the same uh, uh, parallel question. Who are going to be the, uh, the watchdogs on this uh, process of manufacture? OSHA, Environmental Protection Agency, the Food and Drug Administration. And if so, what do they require us as manufacturers to do in making the product and in conveying the product to the customer? Under, under what conditions can we do that and with what notices of caution and warranty. Next slide, please. And then a very interesting issue. It's, a, it's both a technical issue and it uh, goes beyond that. In terms of patent protection, should it be sought on the product for making uh, for the beads themselves or should it be sought on the product process or on both? Or is this product we're going to make so peculiar that it would be very difficult for anybody else to find out how to make it and therefore we could practice it secretly. These issues we will debate in class because I will be joined in a debate with or, or a, a patent attorney who is a chemical engineer from Hamilton Smith and Brooke will join me and we'll debate for two sessions the pros and cons of this. And he from his point of view as a chemical engineer and patent attorney will debate with me. I'll act as the foil I was for, for Fritz Meissner and that put some very stupid questions in, and, and then he can kind of slap me down. Uh, next slide, please. Product failure. What can we as the manufacturers do inadvertently to cause the product to fail? For example, let it freeze, overheat it, let it dry out when it should not. And what can the customer inadvertently do to cause the product to fail? Well, he might, for example, if the, if the beads were to be kept damp, he might let them dry out. If they were to be stored at four Celsius, he might let them get up to maybe uh, 40 degrees Celsius one day and they'd lose their activity. In each case, what damage will result? Well, for example, in a diagnostic test, if the beads are intended to demonstrate disease in a patient carrying a disease by an antibody antigen reaction, and the ligand on the bead has died because of heat exposure, and so the test gives a false negative, 
the customer is in serious trouble and therefore probably the manufacturer is because of the liability running backwards from user to manufacturer. So we have to consider these issues. And the next slide gives you an example uh, of tired beads, I call them. They got very tired. Uh, as you can see, uh, they're, they're not feeling well, and if they were to be deployed in a liquid mixture, they'd probably shatter into their component pieces. This happens to be beads, uh, ion exchange beads, that should have been kept damp, were allowed to dry out, really dry out, and you can see the stresses that produced failures. Well, this is only a mechanical failure. That's not so bad as having the total catastrophic biological medical failure that would be involved in a diagnostic test. Next slide, please. And then we come to the issues beyond technical. Uh, and for example, next slide, please. We have to consider these issues centering around the market. Who are the customers? What do they say they want? And is this the same thing that, that uh, you think they really could use? Do they need beads or should they have something else? We will address those issues and the next one, next slide please, as well as that of who are the competitors and how could we differentiate the product we're making from those products already on the market. And the next slide please. And the markets, specifically what markets are we tar targeting and how will we get the product to them, distribute them through distributors or, or market them ourselves. And to, to address this whole set of issues, we're going to have as a guest lecturer, a vice president of marketing from industry in an industry like one that would be appropriate to the, the, this product to debate these issues with us. Next slide, please. The question of how do we price the product? If we are the market leaders, we have some latitude in putting the price about where we want to, but if we have comp competition, obviously that's not possible. And the issues, of course, going back to hazards. What are the hazards to the public or to the user? And what is, a, what is the liability to us as manufacturers if things go wrong? Can we be wiped out? Next slide, please. I've given you an example of a technology-driven case, but as an opposite uh, example, we will consider briefly, for example, starting with a market need. And we see that uh, there is a certain need in the market to do something and we select a solution C out of many different solutions, A, B, C, D, and so on. And we look at the immediate technical issues and the possible solutions, and then that conveys us into the broad technical issues beyond that. Next slide, please. And for example, what, as, as a case, in the, in the manufacture of beer, one problem is to remove the haze-forming proteins before it's bottled, otherwise the beer will become cloudy. One method of doing this is to use the polymer polyvinyl pyrrolitone. We have, if we wanted to do this in beer, the sub-options of using it as a high molecular weight polymer to rem be removed by ultrafiltration, or cross-linked as a film, or cross-linked as hydrogel beads, or grafted to polystyrene beads, and so on and so forth, and we will select four for various reasons that we would discuss. This is a market-driven case, and the f as the final slide, which is really where we started, a technology-driven one. And there are two ways of approaching this thing, which we and the students will discuss. Either there's a market need which we must address, or there's, in this case, exciting new technology, which we don't really know a priori what we're going to do with it, but we could do A, B, C, D, and so on. And maybe we're going to select Q as the opportunity, and then look at the next outer ring, the market. Who is in the market al already? Uh, is there anybody there? Is it crowded? Is there a niche? Is there any market? Maybe there is no market for it. Can the market be developed uh, beyond this conceptual desire and so this moves out? And as I started my comments with my, my gratitude to the pleasure of having worked with students over the years and one of the great privileges of being an MIT professor is the excitement that the students bring to us. They, they keep us young. I was born in the year of PCE, but I still feel young because of the students that I have associated with and I associate with now. If it weren't for them, I'd feel very old. Uh, but be beyond the students as my teachers and beyond my professors at MIT, uh, at McAdams, uh, Whitman, Gilliland, uh, Lewis, there are other teachers I had who have affected me enormously, in, and especially in, in the context of what I just presented to you. From my early uh, experience in industry, a number of 
MIT alumni and Cross 10 alumni, Bradley Dewey, who, if there ever was a, an equal to Doc Lewis, he must have been it. Two giants roaring at each other formed quite a sight. Bradley Dewey, president of Dewey and Army Chemical, and I worked, although I wasn't supposed to in the, in the flow chart of hierarchy. I was the low man on the totem pole, but I reported directly to Dewey when he wanted to call me into his office. And for Charles Almy, and for George, uh, John Lund, and for Hugh Ferguson, and for Dun Shanklin, uh, who's here today, uh, for whom I worked uh, for many years, first as a employee at Dewey and Almy, and then as a consultant of that uh, corporation. And so I'm enormously thankful to the, to the exposure to the world of industry that they gave me, and to many others in industry whom I've worked with, with, with joy over the years. And I'm absolutely delighted to see all of, all of my former students here and to see all of you here today. Thanks for coming.